All right, good evening again. <clears throat> uh, Joshua chapter 1. We're going to continue our thoughts from that passage. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 1, and starting in verse 1. Now, we talked about this idea of Joshua being the servant of Moses. And let's read the first nine verses as an introduction. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, Moses' servant, saying, <clears throat> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all his, this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place of the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Um, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. At this stage of Joshua's life, he is around 80 years old. And he is known as the servant of Moses. And as we talked about our understanding of how he becomes to be known as a servant of God, at the end of the book, becomes important. God is giving him some final encouragement, some final preparation before they walk into the land. Actually, in the very next section of this chapter, Joshua will tell his people, prepare yourself, get your resources ready, because in three days, they're going to cross over the Jordan and possess the land or take uh, possession of the inheritance that God has given to them. Before he does, he gives some reminders to, to Joshua to let him know, think about this, remember where you've come from so that you know where you should go. First of all, you'll notice he talks about the death of Moses. Uh, Moses is very near and dear to Joshua, as we talked about in the last session. He was the person that discipled Joshua. Um, he was very near and dear to the nation of Israel. Imagine this dominant figure in the nation of Israel now is dead. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy says that they spent 30 days mourning for Moses. It was a fairly dramatic event. It, regardless of what the promises of God are, when you go through a, um, a, a national crisis, call it, because a leader that led you and took you out of Egypt, brought you through miraculous things, things that you can't even imagine. And, and, and the one that saw God face to face, it says, uh, the one that saw the glory of God and it was shown on his face, the one that brought the Ten Commandments, even to this day, Moses is the dominant figure. And now, who is this Joshua? <laughs> That's going to take us into the land. God says, remember who Moses was and how I worked with him. Just like that, I'm going to be with you. It's not Moses that did all the work. It was God who did the work. Remember that. He brings that. He brings to mind who Moses was, the example that he had, and the one that Joshua could go back and say, you know, Moses did it this way. This is the, the, the strategy that Moses took. He went to the Lord for guidance every time. And thus, Joshua will carry that forward as he leads the people into the land. So first of all, he, rem he reminds uh, Joshua about Moses, his servant. Second of all, you'll notice in verse 2, 
he reminds Joshua about the promises of God. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I, God, am giving them to the children of Israel. And, and he kind of repeats the same phrase in verse 13 and 4, and verse 3 and 4, that God told Abraham back in the, in the book of Genesis. He, you know, Abraham was separated from Lot, and, you know, you know, and Abraham was talking to God and says, what do I do? God says, look, anywhere you can see, that's your land. That's acres of land. More than acres of land, right? Uh, anywhere your foot treads upon, it's yours. Did, did, Mo, is, did uh, Abraham take possession of the land in real estate fashion that we would? Not really. So what is this promise that he's talking about? But God tells Joshua, Joshua, the same promise that I gave Abraham, I'm going to fulfill through you to the nation of Israel. It's been 500 years plus. Sometimes, you know, we think about the promises of God and says, Lord, where is this promise? I'm not getting it. You told me something that in your word, but where is it going to get fulfilled? And it's interesting in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that Abraham was looking forward to a better land. See, it wasn't about the physical land, was it? There's one aspect of it is, yes, Joshua knew what was waiting for him on the other side of that Jordan. Uh, the land flowing with milk and honey, but it wasn't a place of, uh, let's say, in logical human terms, a very peaceful situation. Joshua would have to go not only over into the other land, but he would have to fight people bigger than him. And the question would come up, God, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? But God says, remember, I made a promise. The same miracles that I did with Moses, I will take you through also. And there is a fulfillment of the promise that we'll talk about in a second. The third thing that you'll notice in verse 5 through 9, he gives another reminder of what Joshua needs to think about. Uh, looking in verse 5 through 9, it's interesting. There's some, um, this morning we talked about uh, when we read the Bible, uh, there's some basic concepts that we learn in school that's always applicable when you study the Bible. Uh, there's a lot of like literature things, right? So sometimes it's a matter of looking at a passage and say, do you, you, know, do you go back to your reading comprehension class and uh, see, do you comprehend this section, right? What is the main point that God is trying to say in verse 5 through 9? There's a concept that I learned in college and uh, it's throughout all throughout scripture and throughout various literature. It's called chiasmus. Uh, I'm not going to do technical detail around here, but the idea is there is a, a, a phraseology that is repeated on both sides of it, like a pyramid. It starts with both sides and it works its way to a corner. The main point of that passage is that middle piece that's not repeated. Okay, um, literature one on one, right? And uh, Reading Comprehension 101. We should take the things that we learn in school and apply it to our life. And something that I've been like harping on a couple of different people on, in different ways. So often we take basic life principles and apply it to every walk of life except for studying the Bible. And uh, we make it so theological that we can't understand what the Bible says and we depend on other people. God didn't intend it that way. God teaches us to use those things in studying the Bible. And so here we have a chiasmus. There is a repetition of activities and there's a central point. And in summary, the central point is remember God's word. I'll show you how that looks like. Look at verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That's a principle, right? God will not leave you. Look at verse 9. At the end of it, God actually says, Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is not going to leave you. On both ends of this description here. The second thing you'll notice in verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Look at the beginning of verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid. 
Second principle, I will not leave you, be strong and of good courage. Verse 7, God says, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Look at the very end of verse 8. It says, You shall meditate in the day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The third principle, I will not leave you. Be strong and of good courage. Observe to do what's in there. And the only thing that's not repeated is at the beginning of verse 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Remember God's word. See, all too often we go about our life trying to figure out logically, human way, logically, on how to live that life. And God says, Joshua, as you go into the land, remember that there was an example in Moses that you can follow. There is a promise that I have given you. If I can't fulfill it, then I'm not God, he's basically saying. And remember my word and all of the blessings that are associated with it. And so God tells uh, Joshua in verse 9, Have I not commanded you to be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You know, sometimes we don't like commandments, do we? Interestingly, there are many laws and commands that are there, and we just kind of do it. We don't like it. You tell your children, even when I was a kid, dad would tell me to do something, and I would do the exact opposite. I would try at least, right? And sometimes I get in trouble, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I calculate, is the punishment worth it, and go off and do it anyway, right? We don't like naturally a commandment. But when a commandment is given, there's a choice that's made. Am I willing to commit to follow that commandment? And that's the exact same thing that God tells Joshua. Joshua, I'm going to take you across the land. I'm going to give you an inheritance and all the example of the power that I can use for you to accomplish that is there. Now go. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, the Lord Jesus Christ does the exact same thing with you and me. What does he say in verse 18? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore, that's a commandment, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Does that terminology sound familiar? We just read it in the book of Joshua. God told Joshua, go to the promise that I'm giving you. Go and follow that command. Now the question is, does Joshua commit himself to following that command? So you have this life in which Joshua is known as the servant of Moses, but before he can be known as a servant of the Lord, he has to be willing to obey his commands. God tells him to obey that command, and when he makes that commitment, he takes this journey down the path where at the end of his life, he is known as a servant of the Lord. You have this situation where, yes, Joshua knows what's on the other side, but he has no idea how anything is going to happen. He's standing at the bank of the Jordan River, and if you look and read the, the, the third chapter of Joshua, it says that the Jordan River was in a flood state. Okay, In a flood state, you're supposed to cross over this whole nation across the Jordan River to cross the land. First of all, he has no idea how he's going to get across. He might have remembered that God was able to split the waters of the Red Sea, but the rest of the nation don't remember that, except for Caleb, maybe. Right? And, and, and so they're standing there, and before anything takes place, in verse 10 of Joshua chapter 1, he tells the children of Israel, go get yourself ready because in three days we're crossing the Jordan. I'm pretty sure most of the people there is like, are you serious? I can barely swim. And we have a flood state river that we're going to drown. Um, we had an opportunity to visit Kenya many years ago and we went to the, the safari. Uh, my, my wife's 
uh, sister or missionaries out there in Kenya at that time. And so we went and visited them. They took us to safari. It's interesting. When you go to safari, you know, you see these pictures on, you know, the shows that you see, right, where the migration takes place from Kenya primarily to Tanzania. And these, and these uh, zebras and, you know, all these different animals are, one, they not only have to escape the crocodiles in the river, they got to cross the river when there's a flood across, the water that's going across. They have two big dangers that are happening, and they dive in hoping the waters would split, but they dive in and most a good portion of them die because either they can't escape the dangers in the water or the water itself. These are human people that have logical viewpoints and say, I can't swim, my children can't swim, I don't know that I can get across this uh, Jordan River. Now we look back at this story thousands of years later, he goes, oh, come on guys, don't you know God can make it so beautifully pathway clear for you to get across? Well, do we face situations that we have no idea what's next? We face it every day, don't we? Yet, God tells Joshua, have faith that I will work miracles for you to inherit that land. And so Joshua takes this step of faith to go across on the other side. The question I had to ask is, if he is going to become the servant of the Lord because of a life of faith, what does that mean? We talk about in Christian life, you should have faith, great. What does it mean to have faith? Faith without works is dead, great. These are all theological terminology that we so often lose sight of what it really means. Notice what Joshua had to go through, first of all, for faith. One of the questions that you have to ask is, why did God tell Israel to go across? Let's say he opens a flood water, he's going to go across, and you're going to destroy every man and woman and child that lives on the other side. Why? That seems like Genocide might be a controversial thought process, right? How could a God who loves tell me to go on the other side and kill them? That doesn't seem like a merciful God. Now do I really want to do that? Becomes a question. Turn to Genesis chapter 12 if you would. Sometimes we look at God's promises and actions, and in our faith, we start looking at human logic, and we forget about God's viewpoint and God's logic. In Genesis chapter 12, we see God telling Abraham in verse 1, Now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. That was a promise that God was given. This land is going to be yours. Skip ahead to chapter 13. Chapter 13. And we see God describing this even further in verse 1. Then Abram, uh, then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. Abram was a very rich in livestock and silver, and, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to a place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to a place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called the name of the Lord. Now there's this incident that takes place with Lot. And in that he separates. Lot chooses Sodom and Gomorrah, or the plains near Sodom and Gomorrah, heads towards that. And this is where God gives them this promise of the land. In verse 12, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And Lot said to Abram, after, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. 
Arise in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. And so this seems like a fairly straightforward promise that God gives to Abram. And Abram says, okay, great, Lord, I, I'm glad that you've given this uh, promise to us, but, um, and he accepts it. But at the end of the day, the question still remembers, why did God choose to give this to Abraham? Story continues in chapter 15, and this is where we get an understanding of what takes place. In chapter 15, God sets up a covenant with Abraham. And he says, you're going to go into this land as an inheritance. But notice he tells them why in starting in verse 12. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon it. And he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. Talking about Egypt, right? Your people are going to go to Egypt, and that was promised to Abraham, and you're going to be there for 400 years. And you may want to ask the question, why God promised that in a second. In verse 14, And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here. For, here's the reason, the iniquities of the Amorites is not complete yet. When Joshua comes to the land, the iniquities of the people of the land is so full that God is going to judge through his people. There's some warnings here, though, because the question would still come up, is God a loving God? There's a, there's a guy who I met on the train at one point when I was going to work. He was reading and says, you know, I know God is love. And he's going to just, he's going to save my family. I said, okay, have they accepted Christ? He says, no, no, they haven't accepted Christ. They're actually very sinful. They're, they're, not, they're not walking with the Lord at all. They've never attributed, they're actually atheists. I said, great. So what makes you think that God's going to save them? Well, because God is a God of love. Well, if God's a God of love and he put the sin of the world on Christ on the cross and he decides to save a person who rejects Christ, how is he God of love when he's punishing his own son for no reason? See, the logic of humans don't make sense when you really start thinking about it. Here you have the Amorites who started a sinful situation. I'll give you one example. A few chapters later, you have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham debated with God for hours to find ten righteous people in the city. And God said, if I can find ten righteous people in that city, I won't destroy that city. How many people did he find that were righteous? Hmm? One. That was Lot. And because he was righteous, God in his mercy sent a rescue for that one person. And even his two daughters and his wife, his wife decided to reject it. Think about that story. The men came to, to Lot. Lot was willing to give up his own daughters. That's the, that's the situation. And the funny part is the men rejected them. It says, we don't want the daughters. We want the men. 500 years later of that same sin in the other cities were brewing. And you might say, God's not merciful. Well, think about it. God gave them the testimony of Abraham. God gave them the testimony of Melchizedek. God gave them the testimony of Isaac. God gave them the testimony of Jacob and it got to a point where God said, you know, before it corrupts the family of Jacob, I'm going to move them and make them slaves in Egypt. Because if you know the story of Dinah and Simeon and, and her brothers, you know what took place there. 
before it corrupted God's people, God moved that family out of that area and the, and the sin kept on brewing for 400 years. And if you think that's not merciful enough, when you read the story of Rahab and when the spies go into the land and, and spy out Jericho, this is what Rahab tells the spies. He tells them, God, now before they lay down, Rahab came up to the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you this land and the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who are on the other side of the Jordan, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth so for the previous 40 years they were hearing the testimonies of God's power and mercy on the nation of Israel but you don't see repentance do you so for 500 plus years God kept on showing mercy and mercy and mercy examples after examples saying will you turn to me do you think God is fair in judging them He's still a God of mercy. He's still a God of love. When the Gibeonites came to talk to Joshua in Joshua chapter 9, they said the exact same thing. For 40 years, we knew you guys were coming. And they still didn't repent. In Romans chapter 1, we read this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. To understand the length and breadth of the depravity of the, man, uh, the, 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 the human race in that land, it only takes not only biblical accounts. Archaeologists have found the cities of that land before Joshua invaded. And they looked at the various archaeological things and the, the sins that, that God describes as abominations are light compared to the reality of what was taking place. There were slavery. There were people and children sold for services in the name of worship, both female and men. It got so far that they were willing to offer live children to their gods in fire. God was merciful. 500 years plus. What does that mean for you and me? Second Peter tells us this. The Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, you think about the social calamity, social problems, the depravity of man throughout society, not only in the United States, but across the world. And you see the mercy and love of God in his slowness. Romans chapter 2 tells us that it is in the goodness and forbearance of the Lord that leads man to repentance. You know, sometimes we may get sucked into um, different sins. Even as believers, God will come and, and punish us. The intent is to bring you back to God. Now, if you think God is unfair, he only does this to uh, unbelievers, right? 
not the people of God. God is actually very consistent when it comes to sin. Because the scripture tells us that the wages of sin, the end result of sin is death. Um, you go into sin, it's going to go down the path of death sooner than later. God is very consistent. In Joshua chapter 7, there's an interesting story. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to read it and uh, look into it. At the end of the conquest of Jericho, God told, just wipe out the city. Everything. Every person, every living animal, everything. And the things that you cannot burn and destroy like silver and gold and things like that, take and put it in my storehouse away from the people. And the reason is because he didn't want the people to go and be reminded, because all these things were used for worship. And so he didn't want those to creep into the people of God and take over because it's like a little tiny leaven that kind of blows up and, and destroys the whole nation. In Joshua chapter 7, there's a man by the name of Achan. He goes off and steals a few things. Some good clothes, some royal garb, or who he thought he was, right? Some silver, some gold, some bronze, some iron, all these good stuff. Hey, by the way, I went and, and, and did the work of God. I should deserve some of that spoil. Although it was disobedience against God. He took it, hid it in his tent. Nobody knew about it. The nation of Israel goes to the next battle in Ai and they get defeated. 3,000 people die. Oh, I'm sorry, 36 people die. Do you know that's the only time in the book of Joshua that you see someone from the nation of Israel that died? It was at the city of Ai. Because Joshua did not know there was sin in the camp. Joshua tore his clothes. He says, Lord God, what are you doing? We had this mighty victory and now we had defeated by a little tiny city over here. Your name is at stake. What's going on? God says, go check out. There's sin in the camp. Have you ever wondered why at the end of that story, he finds Achan, he takes Achan and his whole family. By the way, they were, compl they were complicit on that sin because if you're hiding this much stuff in the middle of your tent, your whole family knows. You know what's going on. None of them spoke. And not once do you see Achan and his family repent and say, I am so sorry. You have a verbal assent to a certain extent in the scriptures, but it doesn't say that they were repentant. They had to kill Achan and his family. They stoned him to death. They put a pile of rocks on top, and it was a memorial later on. As to the sin that exists in the camp that destroyed the people of God in living by faith. See, God is very, very consistent and very merciful to the sin that exists not only in this world, but also amongst the people of God. And the question would have to be raised, what sin do I have in my personal life, and maybe even a corporate sense? Are there sins in our local churches that needs to be addressed? You know, the thing is that we are so secretive as a people of God that you, don't, you and I don't know anything about what goes on in our life. And it's become even more secretive because I can do those little sins on my cell phone, can I? Even as a teenager now, you get a cell phone. And I'm not saying these are bad equipment. These are good things. There's some things, usefulness to it. But please be careful because those little sins in your private homes, just like Aiken, has an impact on the people of God. And the same thing that you do today in your privacy has an impact on the church. God will not bless in your own personal sins. Not only you, but also the church. If you're not being effective in your ministry in your local church, you got to ask, is there a secret sin that needs to be addressed? To be removed so that we can say that we are a people of God willing to live by faith according to His holy standards. How many people look at the Christians and say, they're not living like Christians? How many people will say that, oh, by the way, what does the word Christian really mean? Have you thought about that? It has a phrase Christ in it, so it has something to do with Christ, right? And then you have the extension of that. It literally means little Christ. It means that when they see me as a Christian who's proclaiming the name of the Lord, they should see the Lord.
Romans chapter 2 tells us that, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And we do you not, do you not, oh, I'm sorry, and do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads us to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness of your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. God wants us to live a faith according to his holy standards. Second thing you notice about Joshua is the fact that God takes Joshua through the book uh, as we read the stories, and you see that God wants Joshua to go and fulfill his will according to the plan and approaches that God lays out, not my logical step. I'll give you a couple examples. We already mentioned that they're at the front of the Jordan, right? Floodwater state, wrong time to get across. How do you get across? Well, what Joshua doesn't know is that on the other side of the Jordan, the harvest is there. The, the manna will stop, and when they do get across on the other side, you have the situation where they can right away, the first day, start enjoying the produce of the land. If they had waited for the floodwaters to slow down where it's easier to get across, well, what happens on the other side? There's no produce. you you got to wait for the harvest to enjoy the land. And God said, you go there, take possession, enjoy the land. When God says that, he's going to give it to you right away. He sets it up so that you got to get across the Jordan in a way that you can't imagine. Only Joshua and Caleb has experienced the crossing of the Red Sea. The rest of the nation did not. They heard stories about it, but they did not experience it. So they were able to experience where their forefathers didn't also experience, and they went across the Jordan River. I'll give you another example. They come over there, and they send two spies across ahead of time, and and, uh, and, and these spies are protected by a harlot, of all people. <laughs> uh, and, and the interesting part is God takes this harlot who says, your God is God, and brings her into a lineage in which the greatest king comes out of, King David. And later on, she's actually in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1. Think about it. A sinner of sinners. God in his mercy accepts and say, it's going to be in your lineage that God's son is going to come out of. That doesn't seem logical to me. They get to the conquest of Jericho. This is crazy, actually, in, in human terms. I want you to be very silent, walk around the city once, walk around it again another time, and do this for six days. On the seventh day, I actually wonder what the people of the city was thinking. Right? What are these people walking around? There's, they can't get through our walls. Seventh day, walk around it seven times, and then blow the trumpet and shout, and the walls will come down. Okay, we can look back and say that miracle is great. But if I were one of the two spies, what would I think? God, you promised that you'll save Rahab. If you're bringing down the wall, how are you going to save her? She's living on the wall. See, the walls fell down and Joshua said, go in and bring Rahab out, then that section of the wall fell. Totally illogical. Wouldn't have never expected that. Is it not even physically possible? God says, I will do that approach. Here's another one. If you look at the map and you see the nation, the, the, the nation of Israel today and during that time, you have the Jordan River. When they cross into the land, 
They're in the middle section of the land. They conquer Jericho. They go across to the west to Ai and then to Gibeon. On the other side is the Mediterranean Sea. That is not necessarily a smart way to conquer the land. We might say, oh, why, why not? Well, think about it. They basically crossed over the Jordan, and they can go back because floodwaters came back, by the way. There's people to the north that's ready to attack. There's a whole set of cities down south who's ready to attack. On the other side is the Mediterranean Sea. Where are they going to go? They basically, from human terms, walked into a trap. God didn't tell them to go from the south and work your way north or go all the way to the north and work your way south. Now that makes sense when it comes to military warfare. But no, you're going to get across the Jordan River that I'm going to open up for you. Great. And you're on the other side. I'm going to trap you. That takes faith. See, Joshua had to go live that life to fulfill God's promises and God's will in his plan in his approach. You see, if you and I want to be the servants of the Lord, we sometimes just need to look at the command and not question it. If you're a servant, you don't necessarily question the master, do you? Master tells you, go do it, and you go do it. That's a step that you have in Joshua. In Matthew chapter 28, we read, go in, go and make Disciples of all nations. Think about the New Testament. How did God tell us to go make disciples of all nations? In Acts chapter 1, he tells us that, you know, stay here in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit will come and you'll have power. And then you shall be witnesses of me where? Jerusalem, right? Secondly, Judea and Samaria. Thirdly, to the uttermost part of the world. Why Jerusalem? Is it home? Is it the place that I'm home and I, I should start my ministry there? That's what I always heard growing up. Recently I was thinking about this and it kind of threw me off because as I was studying it, I was realized Jerusalem wasn't home for any one of the disciples. Galilee was. It was on the other side of Judea and Samaria. Jerusalem wasn't home for them. They came to Jerusalem maybe three times a year. For a, for a feast. You see, God told his disciples, go make disciples, but I want you to start where you had your greatest failure. The, dis, the, the person that you idolized and you walked with and you called the Lord, when he was in human terms, had the greatest need, every one of them ran away. To a point that Peter, who said, oh, I'll go die for you, Lord, not only denied the Lord, he denied him three times, and on the third time he swore and said, I don't know him. Everybody knew what took place in Jerusalem amongst his disciples. And in front of every single person that knew uh, them, Peter had to stand up and say, Jesus Christ is alive and Lord. question on the table is have you gone to your greatest failure and witnessed you know those friends that know the know your history the things that you did and the sins of your youth have you gone to say yes I've sinned but the Lord is merciful See, that's not human logic, right? I should get away from them. Get away from all the baggage that I've already created. I can start fresh right over here. No, that's not how God wants us to go and witness. He wants us to start at our greatest place of failure. What about Judea and Samaria? What is that? That's still not home for them. If you read through the Gospels, you'll notice how many times the disciples were afraid to go to Judea and Samaria. It, when Jesus Christ wanted to go into Judea, Tim and you know, Thomas said, well, I guess in John chapter 11, I believe it is, he said, I guess we'll go with Jesus and we'll go die there because there's people ready to kill Jesus and his disciples. 
They were afraid to go, but they were willing to follow Christ. When they went to Samaria, they didn't talk to anybody. They went to a whole city, brought bread, and nobody knew them. Because they were afraid of the culture that was there. You see, God asks us to witness in our greatest point of failure. Then he tells us to go to uh, witness in our greatest place of fear. Before he sends us to the foreigner. Which is the uttermost part of the world. You see, home might be comfortable, actually, to a certain extent, isn't it? See, that doesn't seem logical for you and I to fulfill God's will. But he tells us to do it his way, in his plan and his approach. Faith requires me to obey God in his holy standards. Faith requires me to obey God in his approach. The last thing, turn to Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23, we have this. Faith involves focusing on God's power. At the end of all the things that you do as a servant of the Lord for God, you have this in Joshua chapter 23, in verse 3. He tells his people, he tells, brings them over, and he says, You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. You see, we give a lot of credit to Joshua, but at the end of the day, he didn't do anything on his own strength. Yes, he might have physically did a few things, but it was God who fought for you. It was God who provided for them. It was God who gave them the land. God who blessed them. Everything is of God. If there's anything in your life, I believe, that you can attest to your own strength and ability, you need to get rid of it because God's not involved in that that aspect of it. If you want to be a servant of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it tells us this. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. If you think you're smart, please go to the Lord. (laughs) Not many mighty, If you think you're strong, go to the Lord. Not many noble are called. You might have a good position or status in society. That doesn't mean much to the Lord. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world to put to shame, uh, uh, and the things which are despised of God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. If there's any ability that you have that you think, oh, I'm pretty good at this, you're glorying in yourself. That's not a life of faith. That's not a servant of the Lord. We see the fact that faith in Joshua's life looks like in three different ways. It involves following God's standards of holiness, both personal and corporate. It involves fulfilling God's will in his plan and his approach. And it involves focusing on God's power. What does that mean for you and me? Look at chapter uh, 24. Chapter 24, in closing, we'll read this. Chapter 24, verse 14, we read this. Now therefore, Joshua tells, Fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in which the land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, the next time you go take a look at that plaque on your wall, think about it. First, am I known as a servant? Second of all, am I known as a servant of somebody who discipled me? 
Am I a servant of the Lord in the end? Am I living that life where the Lord says, go and I obey, even when it doesn't make sense? When he tells me to go this particular way and this particular approach, I'm willing to do it because he said so. You see, Joshua is now about to die, and he does die, and he's called in verse 29, the servant of of the Lord. His epitaph. We started what started our session last time with that, right? You can look at his tombstone and say, Joshua, the servant of the Lord. And he lived 110 years. However long our life is, that little dash mark on our tombstone, right? Hopefully, right above that, it says, I'm going to use my name here, Elson, the servant of the Lord. Because at the end of the day, you think about it, if I'm not called to serve in the Lord, what's the point? God uses, in, uses us in many different ways, doesn't he? he? We don't like to be servants. The interesting part is when you look at Joshua, he was born a servant. He was born a slave and a servant of Egypt. And after 110 years later, he is called the servant of the Lord, one of the highest positions in all the universe. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for the life of Joshua. We thank you for who he is. We thank you for how you worked in his life, how you brought Moses into his life to train him, how you put him in a place to serve you. We thank you for the example that Joshua was, that he was willing to commit to your commandments, to live that life of faith in which, when it doesn't even make sense, he was willing to walk it and live it and do it. So we ask that we will be able to have that same faith, Father. Uh, Your word does tell us faith without works is dead. Help us when we say that I have faith in the Lord, that others can see a life of faith that portrays the Lord, that gives glory to the Lord, in which it's not in our strength, not in our might, not in our intellect, but as Scripture tells us that we would be able to give all glory to Jesus Christ. Help us to apply these things into our life. We thank you for this evening that we're able to learn, and we thank you for pointing us to you. We want to give you all the praise and glory and pray for all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.